Hi everyone, Tom here. I just wanted to let you know that we have a very special guest co-host today. Lucy Siegel is a journalist and an author and a podcaster. She's a reporter on The One Show for the BBC, a former columnist for The Observer and The Guardian, and author of Turning the Tide on Plastic and To Die For, a brilliant book about the fashion industry. She's also the host of the outstanding podcast So Hot Right Now that you should all be listening to by now. So this is our last week without Christiana and we miss her, but we're thrilled to have Lucy and it's going to be a lot of fun. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. My name's Tom Rivikarnak. I'm Paul Dickinson. And I'm Lucy Siegel. That was such a lovely introduction. (laughs) Thank you. This week, we are talking about the sustainable fashion industry and how it can become more sustainable. And we have an interview with Marco Bizzari, CEO of Gucci. Thanks for being here. So this is our second week with a guest co-host, and it's a lot to live up to, Lucy. We had a lot of fun last week with Kumi Nadu, but it's thrilling to have you here. How are you doing? How's lockdown working out for you? Lockdown is okay. It's peaks and troughs. This is definitely a highlight, deputising for <laughs> Christiana Figueres. <laughs> you know, we were very lucky that we got to interview Christiana oh, on you did? our yeah, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I renamed my dog... Bobby Figueres, because he barked at the end. Um, well, Bobby can't believe it, and I can't believe it. Well, you know, there were some very aggressive tweets from Christiana today wondering whether she's going to be allowed back into the podcast after Kumi's performance. So you better watch out. You might be attacked on Twitter after this. Yeah, that's those are, those are big shoes to, to she fill. She has a lot of followers on Twitter, just saying. Well, I know, and I do feel intimidated. You should. I mean, in a nice way. In a, in a, in a nice way, but yeah, you should, yeah. I'm just going to have a little cry over here. If I duck out of this Zoom No, 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 no. You shouldn't I'm cry. You should be sobbing. nervous. Nervous. That's we yeah. normally tell everybody who comes on the podcast to just ignore Paul before we begin. I'm sorry I forgot to give you that part of the briefing. Um, Lucy, how, where are you for lockdown? Well, I'm I'm in sunny Surbiton, so I, ah. I moved out to the suburbs. In, and the, you, in the United Kingdom for our global listeners, right? Yes, in the United Kingdom. I was just going to say, if, if you are um, not from Surrey, I'll explain where Surbiton is. <laughs> and it's uh, it's outside of um, London, but not that far. And I live on the River Thames. Ah. So I have a kayak and Hence, I spend a I lot know of time. Your Instagram tweets are getting stuck in the weeds and things like that. I've followed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Has that happened good. recently? No, because the river's dropped. So the the thing that's happened today is that it's the start of the coarse fishing season. Okay. So it's the point at which... Big date in the diary. Big date in the diary. We've had guys literally waiting, setting up their tents three days ago. It's like Glastonbury, but for fishing. And (laughs) I moved from quite an image, actually. Yeah, I mean, it is. I'm looking at it now. It's quite an image. I I changed from getting caught up in trees collecting plastic to getting accidentally hooked on fishing hooks. So I moved from one catastrophe to another catastrophe. So so you go out in your in your kayak collecting bits of plastic from the trees. That is a very wonderful and deeply eccentric image. Well, I have to because yeah. there's lots of plastic and there's lots it. of birds nesting, I love and it. then they have their chicks, and you know it's very you have to take responsibility for the wildlife around you. Yeah. So if you move here, you spend your whole time worrying about uh, a, a a bird ingesting plastic. Paul, mm. unless you tell me now that you are combing the beaches of Brighton, picking up bits of plastic, I'm going to think badly of you. Uh, yeah, well, I spend a lot of my time doing that. Do um, you? And, uh, thanks, you know, Paul. I mean, well, no, you know, I mean, yeah, thanks me. True. No, but, 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 but I, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, unless I'm exaggerating. I mean, I've done some of that for sure. Um, <laughs> the point being that essentially, you know, the thing about plastic is we just want to use less of it, frankly, and we don't want it to go into the oceans and we don't want it to go into water. And it, it's quite simple. And if it's bad for animals, it's bad for us. In fact, if you give me a moment, I've got poetry envy from last week and I'm going to deliver my rather Ooh, rather dark This poem. is a big moment. Okay. But I haven't prepared it, so I've got to go and find it. So you have to talk about something else. Sorry. Can I, can I tell you something about plastic while yes, you're looking yes, for yes. your poem? Okay. So I am one of three people 
who has had their urine tested for plasticizer chemicals. Oh, my God. Yeah. There's a conversation stopper. It's <laughs> And, <laughs> no, it's uh, a conversation starter, as far as I'm concerned. Tell us more well, about the yeah. process. Yeah, anyway, the plasticizer levels in mine were off the chart. And this happened in Holland last year. So what they're starting to do is to make the connection between plastic in the human body yeah. and things like endocrine disruptor chemicals and stuff like that. So they found plastic chemicals, so plasticizer chemicals, which are on the restricted substance list. Oh, my God. In my urine. Sorry, I shouldn't. I, I need to find keep a better saying, way of phrasing this. Keep saying this. urine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you allowed to say that on a podcast? You can't, I just can't imagine it's, it's all the, of the, your <laughs> listeners. You can't say the other one. You can say, okay, off. I got it. Yeah, yeah they didn't sensory. test the other. But I just imagine all your listeners. I'm losing all your listeners. I'm doing such a great job, Christiana. <laughs> oh, it sounds <laughs> very competitive right now. I get it. Oh, fine. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. You see, Paul, Paul <laughs> yeah, would no, think no, badly of me yeah. because I'm from a rival podcast. But anyway, <laughs> why, why are there substances that are on the, the, the harmful banned list of chemicals in plastic packaging? It's appalling. It's absolutely outrageous. And I, I mean... I feel like I'm sort of to some degree on top of these issues and I had no idea that they were so present in your body that they could be tested in yeah. that way. That is awful. Mm. Yeah. And it's the impact on wildlife that is key. Now, Clay may afterwards decide to edit this, but I am going to respond to my poetry envy that I developed last week by delivering something quite dark, actually, if I may. And it's a response to a listener, actually, who's a distinguished filmmaker who made contact with me and I had a chat with her and she talked about species extinction and how, you know, they, you know, they, they make wildlife programs, but there's something about like at the end of the program, you know, you, you send five pounds to kind of save the lion or something. And actually, it's not like that. It's, it's like this. There's a famous poem from Martin Niemöller, uh, who was an enemy of the Nazis. He spent seven years in concentration camps during the war. And he wrote a famous poem. It said, first they came for the socialists and I didn't speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. So influenced by this filmmaker... I come up with a, a little poem, and I'm sorry to share something dark with you, but it's about that personal identification thing, and I call it extinction. And it says, first it came for the golden toad, and I did not worry because I was not a golden toad. Then it came for the monk seal, and I did not worry because I was not a monk seal. Then it came for the Caspian tiger, and I did not worry because I was not a Caspian tiger. Then it came for me, and I realized it was me. Wow. Sorry about that, but it needs saying. Keep Don't apologise. Keep it light, Paul. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I know that we're here that to entertain, but I just That's, think, that was you know. A, no, that was an that amazing was a moment. moment. That was an amazing moment. That was great. That was shocking. Well, I mean, and, those, those, yeah, those yeah. creatures really are extinct. And the point yeah. is, it's like, it's not like they're being lost. It's part of us that's going. Yeah. And that's where I think we're getting disconnected. So, Lucy, seeing as you're here mm. and understand something about an industry that's driving some of this, mm. you know, you've written brilliantly, um, spoken so much about fashion and its negative impacts. It seems like there's no limit to fashion. It seems like there's a limitless appetite in us to just keep buying. I heard you talk about 500 billion more T-shirts by 2040. Mm -hmm. There's only 9 billion people in the world. That's, mm. that's, that's 100 each or something. It's just, what, mm. what's going on? How can we, have we got a disease called fashion? Oh, that's such a good line. Yes, <laughs> we do. We do. Mm. And it's by 2030, there's going to be, well, this was pre-COVID, that it was projected rather conservatively, that we are on about 62 million tonnes of uh, apparel, of clothing across the world is created new from virgin fibres, from new resources. This is not stuff that's been recycled or in any sort of circular economy. And that is projected to increase by 2030 to 102 million tonnes, which would equate to an extra 500 billion T-shirts indeed. And obviously this fashion footprint is not equal. So, you know, talk a lot about climate justice on this show. And, you know, if you think about fashion footprints, somebody in Bangladesh or Haiti 
it has very few garments. Yeah. And then in the UK, in Australia, UK, I single out because we're a big fast fashion uh, user. Um, America, we will have... United States. United States, sorry. <laughs> United States, we will have a ridiculous amount of clothing increasing, you know, exponentially. And we don't have time to wear it. So, you know, mm. if you are a consumer of fast fashion, okay, I'm going to say this. First of all, if you're not a consumer of fast fashion, and fast fashion is the main system of production, which gives us cheap clothing, which is um, uh, produced rapidly to fill what we call a trend window. So if a right. celebrity is wearing a certain thing, it needs to be in the shops before everyone forgets what the celebrity is wearing. And is that by definition cheap? Or could it be expensive, fast fashion? Fast fashion it is a production system that is cheap. Okay. So, yes. I'm, so, I'm just got to check in with you, Lucy. Yeah. What happened if if we did forget what the celebrity was wearing? What's the what what you know what's what, what the, are the price sort of, that you pay? It, exactly. Well, the price that would probably be paid is that um, a buyer who'd ordered the collection would be fired. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank so you. there is a lot of pressure. Mm. throughout the system on various people at various times. And there was a show, like a fly on the wall documentary about a ultra fast fashion brand because we're now in the internet age. So things have sped up even more incredibly. Um, and there was a there was a show where they followed this, this company in Manchester, this brand. And it was just actually just people being really horrible to each other. Wherever they were in the chain, because there was so much pressure, the pressure. barking yeah. orders at people, barking, yeah, change this, get this, blah, blah, blah. And all sort of civility had been stripped out of the system, uh, in my opinion. But this fast fashion system, this rapid system of production is characterised by offshored labour. So some of the lowest wage economies on earth produce this fashion. And that is why it tends to be at low price point. It's not all at low price point. So there's some truth in the idea that you can't always tell how good or bad a fashion brand is by the price point. But it is it is distinct from the luxury fashion system, right? which is... Um, mainly made in a different, using a different system. And the price point is very, very different indeed, as you will know. Is there, I mean, is there any way to talk about, I mean, at the moment, it's such an interesting moment to talk about this, right? We're coming out of the lockdown and we're basically being encouraged to go out and shop for patriotic reasons. Tell and me get, about it. Get consumerism <laughs> moving as a, as a way to do, I don't know what. And I mean, Boris Johnson is saying shop for Britain in the country we're in. There's equivalents around the world. Um, there was this thing to go wild in the aisles with 70% reductions. I mean, it doesn't matter how that stuff is made, right? That's an unsustainable consumerist pattern that we that we need to move beyond. Is that right? It's a disgusting dereliction of duty which turns citizens into consumers and consumption is their only worth and their only value. I mm. think it is the most disgusting response to the emergency that we find ourselves in. And it's being replicated in other economies, Australia. I, I posted about this on my Instagram account sort of quite innocently on Saturday morning. And within about 10 minutes, I had 400 messages from people going, yes, I hate this. I hate this. And also, you know, a lot of people have been have really bought into an idea of green recovery. Yeah, absolutely. This is the opposite. That's what I thought this we were doing until three days ago. Yeah, 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 we were. I mean, it's a total sham. It's ignorant. It lacks imagination. I mean, I can't find enough damning words for so you, this strategy. You're but, on but, the but fence. Just for fun, <laughs> let, me, let, let me challenge you. Let me challenge yeah. you. Let's say I'm Boris Johnson here and, oh, I, say, and I say to you, <laughs> let me say, I'm not going to try to do the impersonation, but Lucy. Oh, actually, if we're not going to buy. He's going to do the impersonation, isn't he? If, yeah. we're not going to buy, if we're not going to buy, if we're not going to buy lots and lots of clothes, then then what are we going to do? To get the economy back. It's uncanny. We, it is uncanny. <laughs> Slightly distressing. Is there a helpline number for this? No, this is you with <laughs> Boris Johnson and he wants your answer. Give it to me now, Lucy. It is a, it's, well, it's not, first of all, Boris, it's not incumbent upon me to come up with uh, an imaginative, sustainable green recovery plan 
Um, there you go. Th- all I can tell you is that this one is a really, really bad idea because it perpetuates a massive problem. It traps even more people who are, you know, let's face it, a lot of these consumers are young. They're going to find it very hard. They're going to be disproportionately affected by unemployment. And what are they going to do? They're going to pay for this recovery on their credit cards. They're going to end up paying a number of times to finance this recovery. We've got a huge uh, problem with consumerism and particularly around the consumption of cheap clothing which is mirrors addiction very very closely and it is very bad for people's mental health and we know that debt they carry this debt for uh you know um it can carry it for decades and it can no, ruin look, look, life Lucy, chances I, I, and opportunities. I, I, Boris, are you feeling ashamed? I am feeling ashamed. But Lucy, I mean it's not for now, but I sort of think we we we, you know, the the climate change folk, we need to answer that question because if if feeding and a kind of an addiction is one way to boost our economy, mm. then then I think you know we need to have another narrative. It's just throwing that. But there. there's lot there's lots of other stuff that's happening in fashion, and there's lots of other stuff that if you look and take a circular economy view, for example, there's lots of smart businesses which are moving from uh, from a creation of linear products that are built for disposability and we all pay the cost of that by the way especially with fashion because we have to pay for landfill okay so it's a different kind of fashion right it's not like fashion itself is evil but it's the it's the kind of it's the unsustainable non non circular fashion well we're talking about fast fashion that's where we've yeah. come to this point in the conversation from and yes that for me i haven't been paying attention lucy and i feel admonished wake up paul <laughs> you're actually as bad as boris johnson <laughs> oh it's nice having someone else say that <laughs> So, yeah, but so it's basically what we've done. So what we are majoring in on, it's not that we're kind of saying you can't buy anything ever again. We're looking at a really, really problematic form of manufacture uh, overproduction It's because that's what's happening. We're producing far too much. And we're looking at a linear system that doesn't pay any of the environmental costs or any of the costs of disposal um, and early disposal at that. And we're looking at something actually that's incredibly polluting because it's switching to plastic fabrics. So we're actually looking at a form of plastic as well. And we're saying, hey, the way to bounce back is to buy more of this. And it's complete nonsense. And within, within a lot of that, there are also a lot of other pressures so there we are. That's what I'm oh, totally on the fence about that one. <laughs> <laughs> so let's turn to, so in a minute, we're going to bring in uh, Marco Bizzari, the CEO of Gucci. But just before we do, it would be good to hear, I mean, I totally hear your message and just how disappointing it's been to see this tired old narrative of just rampant consumerism, dig stuff up and use it and bury it back again as a way to get GDP going. That can't be the way to recovery. But you ha- you are a, a great expert in how we can do fashion well and what that looks like. So just before we go to Gucci, how can we do this well? Like, how What does it look like in terms of consumer patterns as well as manufacturing? Well, firstly, we should really acknowledge that the warning about the increase in volume by 2030 with extra 500 billion t-shirts came from the fashion industry itself. Wow. So from mm. something called the Pulse Report, which is through, um, you know, one of those consultancies working with the fashion industry, this wasn't a bunch of hippies who hate <laughs> fashion. This was from the industry. And all I hear are the industry going, we need to do something. This is unsustainable. We can't keep going like this. And that's from the top echelons where we have burnout from, you know, creating directors and new designers right the way through there's such a glut of clothing it's actually quite hard to sell it unless mm. you you resort to these um these techniques that we're used to seeing for fast moving consumer goods like shampoo and we have seen a fashion product almost turn until it's treated as if it was uh, a standardized bottle of shampoo or something like that. And that puts incredible pressure on the system. So that's the sort of bad thing. And a very, very easy answer is that the fashion industry and parts of the industry is desperate to do this, needs to change from this pro-growth logic to earth logic. Mm. So we are a full spectrum industry and we 
go from the cotton bowl growing in the fields right the way to the catwalks or the runways, to the fashion weeks, to the influences. Like there are so many different parts of this chain, but we can't outrun the environment and the ecosystem because, mm. you know, at the end of the day, that's where we get our resources from. Water, cotton, you know, oil, we need soil. We need all of these things. We need farmers. There's farmers in the fashion supply yeah. chain. You know, we're a broad church. So we know that we are eating our own industry and we're destroying our own industry. So a lot of the impetus from change goes to that. So we need to move from pro-growth logic to letting the earth set the boundaries. And there's a lot of very technically minded people, as I know you'll you'll get from, from the chat with Marco Bizzari from Gucci. There's a lot of technical applications and fixes. And there's a lot of um, designers are great because designers, you give them constraints mm. and they design around it Within, and through it yeah. and under it. It's almost and the definition are, of design. Exactly. They're the best people to work with. So we've got this terrible problem and all these kind of skeletons in the closet. Ha ha. You know, oh, should have called my book that. But we also have this immense opportunity and we have um, this wealth of people and resources. And one more thing about fashion at the moment is that we have managed to create a system. I know that sustainability is not analogous with ethical and I've often swap them and yeah. blah, blah, blah. So you can cut carbon and create an absolute nightmare for the yeah. humans in the supply chain, right? And that's one of the really complex things about trying to refashion this whole industry. But one of the things that we do have is certain points of production where we need people and humans are non-replaceable. So if you get this right and you can provide livelihoods for people, like real livelihoods and living wages, you could be onto something really, really important. Mm. So a t tiny observation on that. First of all, thank you for a brilliant exhibition. When I heard the phrase earth logic, I thought, I'll never forget that. Earth logic, very simple principle. I get, I love it. You're right, it's an addiction, actually. And of course, yes, there are these people in the industry under a certain amount of strain themselves, but we also have to point that finger at ourselves and say, we're the addicts. And then the final thing, I will just make a plug uh, for a film that I had nothing to do with, but it's a very brilliant film called Greed with Steve Coogan, and it makes a very so powerful message at the end mm. uh, about the industry and its failings. So look out for that one, Greed 2019, good film. It's such a great film. I actually saw an early cut of it because they had, we made a documentary called The True Cost in 2015, um, a, a, a quite a hard hitting documentary about the fashion supply chain. And there was quite, um, they'd use some of our content at the end, which, um, I, I mean, it's a well-known fact, um, I forgot that Michael Winterbottom, the director, uh, he's written a piece in The Guardian about how the distributor made them, made them take a lot of that content out and the, you know, the kind of legal wrangling. Um, but I went to see an early screening of that and they had um, an animated lion instead of a real lion, like a little cartoony lion from Jungle yeah, yeah, Book. Yeah. So if Don't you give see too the much film, the plot away. But, if you, <laughs> but if, you see, if you see the film, it's quite well, funny. Well, when, yeah. I, when I saw the statistics that you put in there, I, I really cried. And just a, a word on the, just a word on designers. I used to work briefly for a, a fashion designer called Catherine Hamnett and she's very brilliant. Oh, uh, she, 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 she yeah, put a slogan on a t-shirt about atomic weapons, most used press photo in the whole world. What a, what a, what a mouthpiece. But uh, she also uh, was someone who, who uh, helped to pioneer this um, sustainable environmental fashion. And so just to remember that designers can get us out of this madness. Yeah. Um, so can I just say something? Catherine Hamnett's an absolute, you know, goddess. And she basically, she did, you're right. She, she, she set this all up. She did 10 years of deep research into the cotton supply chain and nobody would be talking about sustainable fashion now if it wasn't for Catherine Hamnett. And the other thing about Earth Logic is it's, I didn't come up with it. Um, Matilda Tam and Kate Fletcher, who are two brilliant UK academics who've developed a whole Earth Logic system for fashion. I just want to mm. make sure that I credit them. Love it. So we're now going to turn to our interview with Marco Bizzari and then we'll be back together afterwards to talk about it. This Now, this is a conversation that we had before Christiana went away. And in fact, before the global pandemic hit, we sat down with, with Marco um, a couple of months ago. Uh, now, Marco, as I said, is the CEO of Gucci, one of the world's leading luxury fashion brands. He has been in the sector for a very long time. He spent his career. He first became a CEO in 2005 when he ran Stella McCartney. He then ran Bottega 
You're going to have to help me, Lucy. Bottega Veneta? Yeah, that's good. I think that's oh, right. okay, acceptable. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. And then in 2015, he started running Gucci. This is a great conversation. Christiana's part of this. And then afterwards, we'll be back with Lucy to talk about what we heard. Here's a conversation. Marco, thank you very much uh, for joining us on Outrage and Optimism podcast. Uh, it is a deliberately provocative title because we believe that we need both outrage about what is not happening or it's happening too slow, as well as the optimism about what is happening, including your recent announcements. So um, we will be interested in listening to you today to see where you are on the, you know, optimism and outrage uh, gamut, where, where you're more, uh, where you place yourself more. But before we go to that, um, thank you very much for coming to this recording on your crutches. I am so sorry to see in the you snow. in the snow <laughs> to come up here to the to the third floor, a uh, third floor on your crutches. Thank you very much for for making that huge effort. Um, and could could we first ask you, Marco, when when did the penny drop for you? When did you realize, uh oh, maybe maybe Gucci should also be assuming responsibility here and doing something in the industry that is actually a leadership role? Um, I think it's been a slow process. I believe everything started from Francois Ripinot, the president of Caring, that from, I mean, the last 10 years, he, he pushed the bar very, very high for everybody, especially for the CEOs of the group. So, and then watching what was happening outside in terms of climate change, despite even listening to scientists, I mean, it's mm -hmm. under our eyes. At a certain point, um, I, I, frankly, I realized that despite any kind of thought, uh, I would have not have any any business in in certain period of time if the the things were going to go in the same way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, no so, business on a dead planet. Exactly. So, at, at, at that first and second. The more, the more we, we listen to scientists, the more we listen to customers and employees, the more I realize that if we want to get the best talents in the industry, mm -hmm. we need to be part of the discussion. Mm. And the customers, even if today um, they are not willing yet to pay, to pay a, a premium for what you're doing in terms of sustainability, I think that in the medium term, they're going to choose between companies yes. very, very easily. And so there will be the companies that are going to be chosen, the one that they will not be chosen. So I would prefer to be in the one that they that are going to choose. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that is why uh, at a certain point, um, we accelerated in many things, in many processes. We invest in, in startups, in new technologies. But um, we set targets, 2050 for net zero, 2025 for a reduction in carbon emission of 50%. But first of all, I think that it's very difficult to set scenarios today because something could happen that you don't expect mm -hmm. and the acceleration of the deadline is going to be coming very, very, exactly. very, very soon. And also thinking about 2015, 2050 will be 87. So, and I don't think I will manage in Gucci, will be managing Gucci night when I was going to be 87. So I don't want to give this kind of responsibility to my successors. Mm. So I want to solve the problem now instead of waiting. So of course, I'm trying to do everything possible to avoid, to reduce our footprint, our carbon emission impact. But uh, I was thinking, what, uh, what if, um, we do, as Gucci, uh, a way to um, become carbon neutral today. What we, do we need to do to, to become carbon neutral? And we decided to become carbon neutral back in 2018 um, in, in investing in Red Plus projects because the idea is to invest in nature. I think nature is the answer for these kind of uh, problems and investing in this, this kind of uh, project in terms of offsetting it's not washing my conscience. I think it's very much the only way in which I can make sure that I can deliver this testimony to my successor, making sure that it's mm -hmm. going to reach the net zero impact in 2050. Because in the meantime, in the meantime, we keep on investing in technology. Uh, there are many startups that are working, especially for an industry like ours, in like leather in vitro, 
So thinking developing leather in a way that is different from farmers hmm. for our business, that is going to disrupt completely our supply chain. There would be leather not from cows? Or exactly. Would, uh-huh. So yeah. today, the, the point is that this leather doesn't have the quality that we expect, the scalability that we hmm. expect, but it's going to come. Hmm. So the idea of the offsetting today is we need to buy ears to wait for technology to help us hmm. in disrupting the industry. So we go parallel. Hmm. So that's the reason why. Uh, then I thought, okay, Gucci is become is becoming carbon neutral, fantastic. But we are a drop in the ocean. I mean, even if it's a big company, we can influence many customers and many people because because of the visibility that we have as a brand. So uh, we decided to launch a challenge, a CO, CO carbon neutral challenge, to invite other CEOs to become carbon neutral through this kind of methodology. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the thing CEOs that, of luxury fashion brands. CEOs or? of across industries. Okay. Across yeah. industries. Did you give them a date, Marco? Did you say climate neutral by when? Or what yeah. what what is the timeline? That, because what I'm what I'm understanding from you, and this is a very interesting concept, that you're seeing two different timelines, right? You're saying basically all of us have the opportunity and the responsibility to be carbon neutral now. Yeah. Because we can reduce our emissions and we can also increase the absorption of carbon through nature. So we can all be carbon neutral immediately. Yes. While at the same time, that's a a very steep, let's say, descent curve of emissions. While at the same time, you're working on a longer timeline to for your operations, your products to be um, at net zero. But for that, you need to invest in those new materials and the new technology. Correct. So you're operating with two different timelines. Is that is that what I'm understanding it's absolutely from you? Perfect. Absolutely perfect. And the reason why it's not so easy to be part of this challenge, because when I talk to CEOs, because we, we decided to go carbon neutral and to launch the challenge, but it took like four or five months because we wanted to do it properly. I, don't, I didn't want to do this, the tick in the box that we are doing a marketing thing. So it, it took a little bit of time because we have many rules that need to be respected. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why when I talk to CEOs, immediately they, everybody wants to join. Because everybody likes to be part of the challenge. They want to be carbon neutral. The everybody problem, wants to be the, part of the solution. Exactly. But the problem is there are many issues. The first one, we're talking about scope one, scope two, and scope three. And scope three. So supply chain. Supply chain represents approximately in the fashion industry 90% of the problem. So you can say that you are net zero. And in Gucci also 90? 95. 95. So even worse. <laughs> so... Um, so if we can say that we are carbon neutral in scope one, scope two. So offices, shops, easy. Everybody's saying so, but then yeah, that doesn't help very much. But so, so first is the scope. Second is the transparency. How do you monitor that mm-hmm. and you know tell people what you are doing? So we created in Gucci and in Caring as well um, environmental profit and loss. So for every topic, you understand activity by activity, where is your impact on the planet? It could be water use, plastic use, uh, carbon emission, et cetera, et cetera. So you give a value and you monitor the trend throughout the year to see if you're going the right direction or not. That to me is key. And it's key as well that we, we you need to be transparent because we are working on it. I mean, as simple as that, as you can imagine, but in an industry like ours, we are in kind of used to, I think, because of protecting creativity and all the rest, supply chain, laboratories, uh, supplies, etc., is a completely shifting mentality. Mm. Um, and then this is the second thing. The third one, that you need to have a strategy to invest in technology in order to make sure that at a certain point you will be carbon neutral without offsetting. Exactly. Because that is the main point. Right. Yes. So now with offsetting, we are buying time. Mm-hmm. You know, to make sure that we are reach a moment where everything is going the right direction. Mm-hmm. Then you need to be certified by an external um, company, mm-hmm. because otherwise, if I tell you that I'm beautiful, you can believe me or not. But someone, someone else should should, <laughs> should, should certify that. So it's an uh, interesting uh, I can certify <laughs> that you're very <laughs> courageous. <Yeah. laughs> and the la- the last one is the, the CEOs. They need to get other CEOs being part of the challenge mm. because I think. This kind of collaboration and working at the same table, sharing the activity, sharing best practices, uh, giving transparency in what you do, I think is the key to have an exponential growth Mm. of this kind of uh, topics and activities. So that is why we decided at Gucci to launch 
to launch this challenge. I mean, carrying um, is carbon neutral as well under the same assumption. And I said, for the moment, we have two, uh, two companies. And this, you know, it's at the beginning when, I, when we decided to launch, and because I put my face on it, I, I was a little bit, uh, you know, scared. Because, I mean, it's like when you have a flag, you start running and you turn, turn the head and you see there's nobody following. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> and you say, okay, my God, what's going to happen? But then I asked myself, so what's really going to happen? What is the point? I mean, I don't, I don't risk anything. I, losing my face I don't think so so then I decided to go and we we, we we took this kind of risk but it's I think as well in terms of mentality into the company to push all my team to always think to different solutions when they develop a product when they do something etc I think is the other positive impact that you have on people in, in doing this kind of statements mm. in doing this kind of challenges because at the end the planet and the world is made by communities, small communities, Absolutely. and the sum of communities that makes the difference. Mm. So of, we, we, in order to impart the planet, you need to start from one, mm. and then one and two and four, et cetera. So you, if you have this kind of approach and you impart your employees, the employees impart their families, their families impart their friends, et cetera, that to me is the best way mm. to, to try to solve the problem and to be, especially in an industry like ours, where the visibility of fashion and brand is so, is so strong. Yeah. Well, that's and that's a really interesting point, right? Because you've clearly thought deeply about this and about your responsibility as CEO and about your sector and how you lead. And what have your thoughts been about the role of your company and of the luxury fashion industry in this world that's facing this moment of emergency? Of course, it's absolutely about doing what you're doing, reducing emissions, engaging with suppliers. But what are the other responsibilities of a company like yours, would you say, that reaches so many people and is so aspirational? The, you know, fashion is the second most polluting com- uh, industry in the world. So, of course, we have a bigger responsibility than other industries. Mm. On the other side, the beauty of being part of fashion is that we are able to talk to the younger generation to make sure that these people can, could be potentially inspired or can ask questions to us because I mean, it's very open and uh, the, 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 the activity that we are doing. So the responsibility of fashion is key in a way, on the other side, as I said that from the very beginning, so either we go in this direction or fashion will not survive like the other, mm. many other industries. So it's kind, I, I see that as a, not an option. <laughs> so it's, it's something that we need to do. Yeah. It, it, then you can do and talk about rhetoric and all this kind of thing that is typical of this topic because mm. everybody can, is able to talk about nature, about you know, pollution, about climate change, etc. But in reality, you need to act yeah. at the very end. Yeah. And this sounds very basic. Mm. And you need to talk to people, collaborate with people and working together with people. So going, trying to avoid this kind of obstacles or barriers mm. that governments now are doing because or industries, because if we talk about collaboration, um, the, the financial st- system plays a huge role because if I want my suppliers, see, the business model of Gucci is made, 30% is, a, in, in the, in, is owned by us directly, in a company that 99% of the production is in Italy. So mm. it's easier for us to trace our logistics mm-hmm. and supply chain and supplies, etc. cetera. Uh, so the, the, um, the laboratories, um, they are small, especially in the Italy business model. Are, all the companies are like 10, 15 people. So they don't have the size and the scale to invest in new technology and to become carbon neutral or mitigate the carbon impact. To do so, either we add them as a company, we're doing that because we are guaranteeing certain credits that they have with the banks, or the financial system, they need to understand if they want really to help they need to fa- facilitate the yeah. possibility to access to credit in, with interest rates that are different from the one that they apply to a normal company. Mm. So the, if you look at the holistic approach about that, if you're able to do so in, in these laboratories that are part of the nature, because they are in the farms, they are together in the forest, etc., they are able to invest in regenerative agriculture or anything that makes sense. If you are able to treat and cure the soil mm-hmm. where everything starts because, I mean, the, the cotton that we wear is coming from the soil. If there is chemical in the soil, the, the chemical will be in the, in the cotton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, everything starts from natural-based solution. Mm. So we go back to the same topic. Nature is going to be the king for the future. And the way we, we approach that, to me, is, is key. But all the players, all the actors, need to play a role that cannot be left to one single company or to one single industry. Mm. 
what has been the reaction of your um, of your suppliers? Because if if ninety five percent of the carbon is in your supply chain and you have taken on this commitment, you are basically in their hands. Um, and so what? And 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 you're saying in order for them to upgrade their technology and their processing and perhaps even their materials, um, they need access to credit. So are you putting them in a difficult bind because you're saying? Either you give me non-carbon uh, within a certain period of time or I kick you out of my supply chain. Is that what you're saying? Or are you saying we will help you access the financing that you need and this is the direction that we want to go? Well, what is that conversation yeah, like? Because the, it, did it take them also by surprise? Uh, not really because, I mean, we started to talk about that many years ago. Now we accelerate it. And the answer to your question is the second option in the sense that Today, as Gucci, we take care about the carbon emission of our suppliers. So we pay okay. for it now. So okay. we, we offset. That's part of the carbon right. So right. now. Right. Okay. In the meantime, as we In do for us, parallel, <laughs> parallel, we try. We um, we have agreements with some banks in Italy where we they have a easier access to credit. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to work together with them and to share our best practices because we have the size and the scale to, to innovate in processes or in technology and to give them mm -hmm. open source everything that we, we are able to mm -hmm. get. Mm -hmm. We do that contractually. It's going to take time because we cannot impose in a way. But we, in, in, in the other way, they know, think about tanneries. If the tanneries they don't are, they are not part of the scheme, I mean, it's a waste of many, many possibilities of reaching what we want to achieve. So they need to change as well, because otherwise they're going to disappear. Mm -hmm. So they need to understand that... The, they're the, very the, survival. The business model that they, they, they're do, having today, in five years' time, from five years' time, is going to disappear. So either they change together with us, they experiment, they do research and development. If they need some money, we can give some money. We did some... Um, Exercise together, we together with eight tanneries, we were working together to work on uh, re reducing metal in our bags. So metal freaks, I don't want to be in, in too much detail, but, but we do so many initiatives and so many activities that are not that are not limited to just offsetting. The offsetting mm -hmm. again is because we cannot avoid. It's only a temporary it's solution. A temp we, buy, we are buying time, yeah. but we are investing so much in so many different things, on any materials, on any activities, on the people, because we need to work with university, engineers, people that they know about this, this process. Startups, because there are many startups that are investing in this, in this, uh, in this initiative. We, we are part of it. We invest in them. We collaborate with them. We, we help them in understanding how the, the pro product development is working. Because it is something, if we want to maintain, we, we, we need to maintain the craftsmanship and the quality. Because in a business like ours, the sustainability of the product is embedded in the positioning that we have. Because our product, they're going to last for a long time, maybe forever. Because, I mm. mean, the quality is so, so high. And that is something that is embedded in our philosophy. And we mm. want to maintain that. And that is why we, we keep on producing in, in Italy instead of delocalizing. Not because we don't like other countries, but because there's an history more of under knowledge. under control, yeah. And also more under control. And it's closer, so it's easier for us to, to, to go there and check mm. it. Mm -hmm. It's, it strikes me that there's an interesting um, storyline here about young people. Uh, we know from other industries that uh, other industries are actually struggling to hire the best and the brightest among the young people if those industries are not serious about climate change. Um, and I'm wondering whether you see those putting pressure on you as customers, do they expect a much higher quality product in addition to what I am assuming also goes for your uh, for your company, which is you can only hire the best and the brightest because you're taking these measures. But are you getting the pressure from your customers? Or is this, you know, a 1% of customers around the world that are completely impervious to these topics? We need to clarify the magnitude of our customers because think about luxury business, that is true. It's a luxury business, but the size of the company is quite high and because the company the, uh, is quite big, because the size is quite big, the number of customers we have is huge. Just to give you some numbers, the number of people that are visiting our website on a yearly basis is 150 million. Hmm. 
The number of people that are visiting our shops on a yearly basis is 70 million. 70 million. So we are talking... Many, how many make purchases out of interest? Do you know? There's, oh, I, mean, I cannot share that because sure. I mean, we're going to be under okay. <laughs> cover. <laughs> uh, the conversion rate is... Uh, so it's, NDA it, it, is not in place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same of the, of the other players, put it this way. Okay. But anyway, the, um, I think the reach that we have is much, much bigger than the kind of perceived positioning that we have in the market. Yeah. And because the company is, is very big, we talk to a number of clients that is bigger than the supposed 1%. It's much more than that because we talk to kids that are younger, they don't have a lot of available income, but they can afford to buy a sneaker from Gucci or a fragrance from Gucci because we have different product categories. So we, we can talk to many people to different levels, to different mm -hmm. segments. So the, the reach that we have in the different categories is very, very high. And I think the beauty of being part of a company like Gucci is that we can drive and, 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 and change the narrative because we are so strong. What I realized when I joined Gucci five years ago from a company called Bottega Veneta, that I was shouting Bottega Veneta, but they was listening because, I mean, it's a, you know, a smaller company, more um, no logo, et cetera, et cetera, more subtle. When I joined Gucci, everything that you said, Gucci, immediately is worldwide. Mm. Mm. So if you use that... You have a big microphone. Exactly. So if you use that in the right way, you can lead the narrative. So you can either influence me, customers and employees, but also other companies in the industry. So if you if we realize that, I think the, the, the role that we can play is quite, is quite big. So you can change the narrative from what to what? The narrative, I mean, when we talk especially, we can change the narrative for everything. So we can then the narrative in terms of aesthetic, for example, when, when I joined Gucci five years ago, and, and we, we started working together with Alessandro Michele, the new creative director, the idea was to create something that was going to last, both in terms of business, but also in terms of aesthetic. So the idea was not to change aesthetic every season, it was typical of the 80s or the 90s, but create a kind of an ongoing aesthetic. So you could wear something that was the previous season without people knowing it. So giving sustainability and long-lasting value to the product is as well another way of creating products that are going to last for a longer time, but you don't need to change them mm -hmm. every single time. They're reducing the, the need to, um, uh, to spend in, in other products. That looks weird, same for, coming from a CEO of a fashion company that wants to sell. But on the other side, I think the more you appreciate the quality and the craftsmanship and, and, and you keep mm -hmm. the product and you're able to share them with friends or to resale in the resale market, et cetera, I think is the best you know, praising that to, the, yes. to the company like ours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is from an aesthetic standpoint. From a, another way to think about the narrative is the way we, we talk about, for example, uh, uh, carbon neutrality. If you need to take stance sometimes, I think they, you know, the, to be neutral today in today's world is, is impossible. Because once upon a time we were giving to the government the possibility to talk about anything related to social, politics, etc. In general, CEOs, they were apart from the discussion. Today, I think the private sector plays a huge role especially because the size of the companies in private sector became much, much bigger. They are cross-national, while government tends to become more nationalistic. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yes, kind of a cash 22. So mm -hmm. we are kind of obliged as leaders to speak up and to have the possibility to talk to customers of different culture in different ways and going across boundaries, while before it was not even allowed. Marco, and um, if I could ask one more question, because I don't want to... Um impinge on your valuable time here. Um, talk to me about your vision five or 10 years from now for the fashion industry. What, what, what is the total revolution? Is there a total revolution in the fashion industry? Is there a total revolution in luxury brands in particular in the fashion industry? What is it going to look like? Um, the, the, the kind of advancement that we are doing in terms of uh, materials is quite astonishing. And I think in 10 years' time, everything will be either recyclable or reusable. Um, and also, I think the, all the supply chain will be completely disrupted by the new technologies in terms of, of materials. In tanneries will disappear completely. Mm. Um, 3D printing will help us a lot in reducing this, the, the waste that we have in terms of product development. I think what is going to happen in the next 10 years in our industry will be dramatic. So either we are there 
on top of it or we are going to be out. So that's the reason why we are very careful on what's happening. But I think ideally I would like really to be in, a, in an industry uh, in 10 years from now where we are going to be net zero really without offsetting uh, and having a, the, I mean, many, many talents joining us because we are the leader in, 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 in nature. <laughs> <laughs> nice vision. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for, for giving us a very interesting peek. <laughs> inside into, Gucci. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inside Gucci and into the industry. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. How great to get to sit down with someone who runs one of the world's leading fashion brands. That was not a kind of conversation I thought that we would have on this podcast, but it was so enlightening. Lucy, what did you take? I mean, you've spent so long in this sector. What did you what did you take from that? I really, really enjoyed the way that Christiana grilled Marco. <laughs> I she's, thought she's that good was at that. amazing. <laughs> and I just thought, she's my a, God. She's he, a griller. She is a griller, but he must have had a moment when he thought, why did I agree to this? Because in fashion, we often talk about goals and pledges and all the rest of it. And she's like, no, when are you getting there? Yeah. <laughs> and there was no, it was so forensic, wasn't it? And I just think, you know, Marco's well able to handle that. And I thought he had some really, really interesting answers. Um, and also what I what really came across for me, because I've been following um, Gucci and Kering for a long time. Gucci's part of Kering, right? The larger brand yeah. Kering. It's yeah. kind of holding company, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. And they developed this thing called the EP&L, so Environmental Profit and Loss mm. Accounting System. And when, because I have friends who work for different brands and, you know, and they're involved in sustainability over many years and they get this sort of look on their faces around a certain time of the year and I'd be like, what's going on? And they're like, we've got Reporting to do all these season. numbers and it's really complicated and it's called EP&L and it's like, ah. But that is all kind of like like made the system. And I think I'm right in saying that the whole point of this EPNL structure was to attach the sustainable value to the sort of share price, like embed it in the financials right. of the company. And the idea being that when you trade stocks and all that, which I don't understand, like it's all happens in seconds and nobody cares about sustainability at that point. So you have to like glue it on. So it's all part of the thing. It's all part of the proposition. And, you know, it's, it, was, it was from a really sort of dry, sort of tactical kind of place. And it has become really fleshed out. So you hear Marco talking not just about carbon goals, but also material transformations. And, you know, I know they're using like mushroom leathers and all these, you know. Which growing... is really cool technology, yeah. actually. This kind of beyond so... meat, beyond leather, plant-based, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Or the, or the, so that you're talking about the, the, the in vitro leather. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which they they basically, you know, isolated the collagen and then, you know, then they can grow it. It's it so fantastic. Mm. And you've got this whole setup, which has come from this very dry EPNL place. And then it's sort of like flourished into all different parts of the supply chain in the business. And I think they do that really well. So they have this like website and Instagram account. I say equilibrium, equilibrium, and I think they give it a life force and an energy to some of the mechanics of sustainable thinking mm. and sustainable supply chain. And I think that's really, really clever. I also think it's exactly what they should be doing because they're brilliant at communication mm. and this is a form of communication. But it makes me think like the next crop of designers will think in a different way because Gucci is so, so influential. Mm. And it's like they need to be prepared not just to be creative directors and have their own brand. You know, we, we, we've got enough designers, okay, yeah. in the world. We don't need any more. We need people who can work with scientists at the bench who can isolate collagen and create fabrics and understand the sort of granular techniques for getting the impact out of materials and fibers and making them working with enzymes and making them eco-efficient and making them truly biodegradable and you know fitting into a, a real circular economy not a fake circular economy and that takes a very specific different sort of brain and i hope 
fashion education is ready because yeah. these are the people that we now need. I mean, that science education I thought was fascinating. I hadn't quite realised the degree to which those things are going to come together and that's going to manifest so many of the solutions. Paul, what did what did you take from that? Well, I'm a little bit upset by Lucy, uh, actually, uh, <laughs> ca- calling, <laughs> calling environmental profit and loss dry, uh, you know. <laughs> I've, I've oh, spent... um, so when I said dry, I meant fascinating. <laughs> I've spent 20 years of my life doing environmental profit and loss, Lucy. And you, what you call dry is, is the thing that keeps me going. Uh, Do you actually... have an Instagram account for it? <laughs> <laughs> One thing at a time. But I'm going to actually put a shout out, actually, to to a hero of mine called uh, Eckhart You know, Paul, Vincent. you should run a new podcast yeah. just going through environmental profit and loss accounts and going through them line by line and explaining them. It would be a hit. You know, I, I, I can talk about burning the conversion factors for burning rubber tires in furnaces. I mean, I know a lot about this. Wow. And uh, the point I would make, I wanted to just give a little shout out to uh, a friend of mine who's dead, uh, well, a sort of mentor, really, um, who died in 2008, I think it was, a chap called Eckhart Vincent, a very, very, very wonderful person. And uh, he produced his environmental profit and loss account for his company, BSO Origin, which was a big company, in 1990. So just to say that wow. we've all been at this for a long time, but that is not in any way to decry the unbelievable leadership of Gucci. I mean, before the COVID, um, they have like 150 million visits to their website, 70 million visits to their shops each year. I mean, I know that obviously that's all changed with lockdown, but the incredible platform that company has to really change people's perceptions. Do you know what? Unilever just this week announced that they're going to put the carbon footprint on all their products. There's something in the air at the moment. Like these great companies are starting to recognize they're in a partnership with us. That they're, they're, they're going to, They need to sell us the products and services that work for us. Um, I'm on fire. Uh, but just to say it's not dry. It's wonderful environmental accounting. It's wonderful. <laughs> And I mean, one thing I I came away from that was just being reminded last week when we had Kumi with us and he somewhat controversially said, started off by saying he agreed with Steve Bannon. Yeah, he did, yeah. culture drives politics, right? And actually that there's not been that much attention to the underlying culture of this transition. And I think having Gucci on this week, I mean, they are such a generator of culture. How do you think, Lucy, understanding the dynamics of this space, that they can kind of, the change they can make feels to me, yes, they can do innovation in their supply chain, they can look at materials, all that they should do. But the real thing they can do is they can change the nature of the aspirational culture that actually drives us more towards realizing that climate change and dealing with these different elements of our society is something that we should aspire to. Yeah, I suppose there's two different sides to this. This is a very, very interesting time to have this conversation. So fashion has been called out at the highest levels in you know, the last fortnight, I know that the interview that you did was, um, was a while ago, Yeah. but in the, in the wake of the death of, of George Floyd and Black yeah. Lives Matter, we've been having some very honest and upfront conversations about fashion and it has been a disgrace. You know, a lot of the stuff that's coming out about brands and editors and magazines and that whole, um, edifice of top flight fashion and the way that the gatekeepers have stopped other voices is really, really something that we're going to have to reckon with. And there will be an impact on fashion as a cultural force. Mm. I think that's fair to say. I think Gucci has done a lot on diversity over the, you know, over maybe the last two or three years, I think done some very, very deep work. And I think this mirrors, I think that the brand for whatever reason seemed to recognize that that was the other side of decarbonizing Hmm. and lowering impact. And I think that um, the work that they've done on both will have a lot of traction, but there's still lots there's still lots of issues within this. It's a very very complex cultural supply chain mm. as well as physical supply chain. Mm, yeah. And you know the problem is affordability as well. Yeah. Most people are by definition shut out of this brand because of the price point. Almost everyone, mm. I would say. Yeah. Almost everyone. Yeah. You know, almost everyone. Yeah. And 
how can you, in a world of, of gross inequity, be so exclusive? This is a question that yeah. they're going to have to ask themselves. And there is a, a sort of hot well of anger about this disparity, yeah. understandably, and I think quite rightly, because I think we need to really, really shake things up. Yeah. And I think a lot of our, you know, it's probably a question and a provocation for people like me, because a lot of our firepower and a lot of our anger and investigation has centered on very cheap, low cost brands. And we tend to let luxury brands off the hook because they have a different supply chain, different supply model. They're not immune from some of that stuff. Um, but on consumption and creating this, was it George Bernard Shaw said fashion was a, a um, an induced epidemic? Hmm. <laughs> A brand with clout at this level and a really cultural significant brand probably should carry more blame, should shoulder more blame for creating for creating this the need context. To consume. Yeah. yeah, creating yeah. the context than, you know, some of the some of the um low price brands who attract the most censure. So it's a really, really difficult one. Really difficult one. Sorry, I slightly lost my train of thought. No, but I'm going to I'm going to just leap in and, and just um de- Help me defend out, Paul. a little bit. I, I don't own a single Gucci product, much to everyone's surprise probably. But uh, <laughs> what about that shirt? <laughs> yeah. That, that the, very the, bra- that brown the, shirt you're wearing. Yeah, well I, I'm 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 always looking for the good. Um I think that these premium brands can have a role in leading industries the way you know he talked a lot about um their experimentation um sharing innovation being open source um you know i'm not for a minute suggesting that that you know a, a super um premium brand is the solution to all of our problems and i totally hear about the inequities but just you know some of some of what he said in his defense you know the observation that nature will be king for the future actually nature's king now but it's great <laughs> to hear the chief executive of gucci observing that nature is the king for the future because tying back to what we were talking about at the start actually you know we're all we are nature we're, we're reliant on it and if we chop it down we chop ourselves down yeah i love the fact that you've actually you're ahead of the ceo of gucci on that trend <laughs> um, we we're, we're guys, it. it's, it's, it's a sort of it's a race we're all in together i like to think we all win or we all lose the, the un just launched or the, the british government launches race to zero campaign which is fantastic and they're talking about it's a race we're all going to win or we're all going to lose. And that's, that's a true. really interesting mm-hmm. kind of race. It's the mm-hmm. new zero but, sum. And just just on that, actually, the thing that really is kind of exciting um, is, is when you think about fashion from a, a real circularity, a real circular economy perspective, and you start to think about textiles. And if you produce beautiful textiles, about renting those textiles, which is actually what clothes yeah. rental is. You're renting textiles. And for a textile nerd like me, because for me, it's all about the fabric. Like I can't buy fashion online because it's like, for me, it's like being in a fruit market. Hmm. I, want to, I want to feel the fabric. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is all about the textiles. And if we came back to some sense of that, it would change everything. Mm, I like that. That's great. Well, Lucy, thank you so much. This has been absolutely a delight to have you with us. Um, next time Christiana goes on holiday, we'll know where to come. We really, yes, really appreciate oh, please. your time please. and your expertise on this issue. And it's clearly an area that we should dig more into. I mean, we've only sort of scratched the surface around the ethics of this, the supply chain of it. And it's such a big issue we're going to have to get on top of. So we really appreciate your time and expertise. Um, I've loved it. Great. I'm thank never going to look at a clothes shop the same way ever again. Thank you for that, Lucy. <laughs> Pleasure, Paul. Uh, thank you also to our guest, Marco Bizzari. It has been a great episode. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll be back in a week with Christiana. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 So there you go. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. Outrage and Optimism is a production of Global Optimism and is produced by Clay Carnell. That's me. And executive produced by Marina Mancilia Germán. Marina has been on leave as well as Christiana. So Marina, please come back. (laughs) We need you. There's a team that makes this podcast happen. Thanks to Katie Bradford, Sarah Law, Sophie McDonald, Laura Richardson, Sharon Johnson, Fran Newman, Nigel Topping, and Michael Northrup. Thank you to Lucy Siegel for co-hosting this week alongside Paul Dickinson and Tom Rivett-Karnak. 
Be sure to check out a few of Lucy's books, Turning the Tide on Plastic and To Die For, as well as a phenomenal documentary on fast fashion titled The True Cost. I loved this documentary. You should watch it this weekend. I've put links in the show notes to all of this, so check it out. This week's interview would not have happened without the work of Misha Ahern, Claudio Monteverde, and the team at Gucci. So thank you. And of course, a thank you to our special guest this week, CEO of Gucci, Marco Bizzari. As Lucy mentioned in the episode, Gucci has a specific website and Instagram dedicated to the sustainability efforts at Gucci called Gucci Equilibrium. You can go to equilibrium.gucci.com or check out at Gucci Equilibrium on Instagram. And I gotta say, I agree with Lucy, really cool stuff. I'm very excited to follow them and see what's next for 2020. And speaking of following, come join us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Global Optimism. And while you're listening, subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating and a review. Okay, next week, Christiana is back. You won't want to miss. We'll see you then. Bye.